We're taking a look at some playful pets coming up right after this. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. We've got a fun lineup for you today. We're talking about playful pets. Now, not just dogs and cats. I love dogs and cats. We're stepping out a little bit, exploring the world of pets in a broader way. These are pets you may want to consider for having around the home in the future. We'll discover why this woman finds raising goats rewarding. Plus, she'll share her goat cheese recipe with us. I'll also introduce you to some of my silver lace wine dots and talk to an expert about black turkeys. And if you're looking for an easy way to attract some beautiful songbirds to your garden, I'll show you how to make the simple bird seed treat. We'll also answer a viewer question and talk about plants that are pet friendly. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show. So stay tuned, we'll be back in just a minute. You know, there are a few perks to having some goats around. My friend Susan Harper tells us why she chose to have a couple of nanny goats as pets in her backyard. Well, I've really only been in goats, as you say, a couple of years. Martha Stewart and Julia Childs are their names, and they are both uh, French Alpine goats. And I asked the guys at the local food store, a uh, feed store, if they knew of someone who had milk goats, and they hooked me up with this woman who had one goat. She was so nice, she let me come out, she taught me how to milk. I'm a pretty good milker at this stage because I've been doing it for a couple of years, so I'm pretty fast. This barn used to be the shed for storing all our yard tools. And so we just converted it. The, actually, the fencing was left over from when we had a bird dog in the backyard. We added a couple of extra panels to it and just kind of threw it together. And um, it worked out perfectly. It's about the right size for two goats. My husband built my hay feeder down there and my milking stand. It didn't cost me much to get started. Um, just buying the goats was, was the main cost. They're pretty easy and their personalities, you can see they're just like dogs. They're so tame and sweet and very curious uh, so that they'll stay. Uh oh, she just pulled the mic out. <laughs> Martha, it is a bit of a responsibility because if you want to go out of town, you have to find someone to milk for you. Way you want. I milk once a day and um, it has to be done of course every single day um, because <laughs> it's not good for the goat you know to go to more than 24 hours with a bag full of milk um, but other than that it's just basically um, clipping their feet and warming some and giving them a couple of vaccines a year and that's about it they um, Mine are, unfortunately, I've spoiled them, and so I have to drive to Hot Springs to get alfalfa hay from the racetrack people. Look at Julia, she's gonna eat. Martha will be picky. Don't you wanna eat? Which I have to do probably about every six weeks or eight weeks. And then they just get some, um, some sweet grain in the morning. Jules, come on. All right, she's in there. Anyway, I feed them in the milking stand to get them in the stand every morning and they eat while I'm milking them. That keeps them still and happy during the milking process. The quality of what you put in equals the quality of what you get out of them. And um, I have such delicious milk and um, I think that that is all due to the fact that they are really well loved and very well taken care of and um, that I feed them quality stuff. Gosh, it's been so much fun for me. Um, I never really knew that I would love it this much and love them so much, but you can tell they love me and we have a good time. After the break, I'll show you how to make this easy treat for the birds, tasty treats for the tweets, so stay tuned. Hey, now I wanna show you this really fun and easy way to make some treats for the tweets. These are great for songbirds and attracting them into your garden. It's very simple. What you do is you just start with um, 
a packet of gelatin. This is unflavored gelatin. I'm just gonna pour it in this bowl like this. And I'm gonna take two tablespoons of water, cool water, and just add to it. I'm gonna mix that together. Really just trying to get the gelatin in solution. And then what you wanna do is take a little over a third of a cup of water that's boiling, this is really hot, and the gelatin will dissolve within seconds. You just wanna stir that and make sure it all goes into solution. All right, and this is the binder that'll hold the seed together. You'll see with these little bunt-shaped treats. All right, so it's all in solution. Then you just take two cups of bird seed, whatever you like, and pour them in. And then mix it all together thoroughly. You wanna make sure that all the seed is completely covered with the gelatin, all right? This has a mixture of all kinds of things in here. You can see there's, there's sesame and milo and black sunflower seed. Just make sure it's all mixed together like this. Next, what you wanna do is take a mini bunt pan or a muffin pan and use a, a spray nonstick oil and spray them just like you're gonna bake something. And then what I like to do is just fill these up to about halfway. One big spoon is about all you need for each of these. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pop this in the refrigerator for about two hours. That gives the gelatin time to set. When you'll bring it out, set it on the counter and let these come up to room temperature. They're much easier to get out of the muffin pan if you do that. And then just set them out on a rack like this to dry. Once they're dried, you're ready to pop them in your favorite bird feeder. One of these suet houses is perfect because it has the cage. You can just drop the little treat inside there and it gives a little protection from the rain. These are fun and easy to make. Give it a try. A few weeks ago, we had a nice little snowstorm where I live. This type of cold weather doesn't happen often here in the South, so it was a nice surprise and so beautiful. I have several breeds of poultry here on the farm, and one of my favorites is a chicken breed called the Silver Laced Wyandotte. You see, this is a breed for cold weather. Let's see how they handle all this white stuff. Well, this particular breed is called a Silver Laced Wyandotte, and they were developed in the 19th century. And even though they're a little skittish today about getting out here in the snow, they were actually bred for cold weather. It came from upstate New York. Come here, girl. Just look at the beautiful feather patterning on them. I just think they're ab absolutely exquisite birds. And they have a comb, which is called a rose comb, which is very short and low to the head, which prevents the comb from freezing. With other breeds, you have a tall single comb that can freeze when temperatures drop into the teens or even below zero. Now, take a look at this one. This is the actual, this is a cockerel. Uh, the, others, the other one was a pullet. All these are pullets and cockerels, meaning they're all under one year of age. And uh, what I love about these birds is this lacing, hence the name Silver Laced Wyandotte. This is a dual purpose breed, uh, considered an American breed, and they're good both for egg production and for their meat. You wouldn't need this many for a backyard flock, but this is a great breed because they're, they're very gentle. You see they're a little spooked by me, but they're, uh, they're moving out. Okay, go on girl. I think they're more afraid of the snow than they are of me, but they're, they're a great dual purpose, gentle breed. Just a few hens have in your backyard. Well, they'd supply you with all the fresh eggs you could eat. We'll talk turkey right after the break, and a little later, I'll answer a viewer question, so stay tuned. This past fall, my friend and rare breed expert and poultry specialist, Marjorie Bender, came to visit me here at the farm. Well, we had a nice chat enthusiasm. about black turkeys and poultry conservation. Look at those beautiful <laughs> they, birds. They are really a lot of fun to have around. We have uh, about 13 of them, and they're about four months old. Oh, now. very good. So they're about halfway through their growing period. That's right. I know as a child, I was fascinated by turkeys. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I think the, the, the symbol of Thanksgiving, and you see these enormous birds. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's so proud that they're an American species. Help me understand from the uh, American Livestock Breed 
conservancy standpoint, where the organization feels the turkey is, the heritage turkeys, the various breeds, are they in fairly good shape from a population standpoint and from a genetic standpoint? Are we, are, are, are we losing ground with, with, with yeah. heritage turkeys? Just if we look at no, numbers, I can say that we're improving. In 1997, we did a census and there were a little over 1,300 breeding birds, and that's how we measure the, num the population health, because the breeding birds actually create the next generation. We are now at about 1,500 breeding birds. That's a huge increase in population. There are a number of varieties of, of heritage turkeys, as we call them, or standard varieties of turkeys, and those populations remain endangered. And what I love about what you're doing here is you're actually focusing your attention and you're focusing your energy. What you've done is you said, I'm gonna do a very good job of conservation with these two um, varieties of turkeys. Our blacks are larger than the slates, so we're using the blacks to try to get the size of the slates back up. Yeah. You know, when visitors come to the farm and they see these birds, they immediately want to know, how can I help? And I say, well, you know, you need to eat them. Yep. You, need to, you need to ask for them, ask for them in your supermarket. That's right. You can do a lot of things. The first step was when they came to your farm was to learn and they ask questions and they start to understand what biodiversity means within our agricultural animals, within our farm animals. And what that means is choices. Okay, so they learn about that and why that's important. Then they can vote with their dollars. They can eat them, they can enjoy them, they can tell their friends about them so the story goes on. Some of them may choose to raise a few. For you as a breeder, you've got somebody who's buying some to raise for themselves. Well, it's a thrill having you here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I'm so pleased to see that you are an active breeder and really helping to make sure that these turkeys have a place in our lives in the future. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm and support. You're welcome. Take a look at these little birds. Now these are some you don't have to feed. What's interesting is this is a Victorian bird feeder. I think the modern ones are a little more efficient. Here you just would put some seed in here and hopefully that would attract some of the little guys. And these little cast iron decoys would also serve to attract them as well. Now it's time for viewer questions. Lately I've gotten a lot of questions from viewers about what plants dogs and cats like. Well, why don't we take a look at some of the things that I planted out in my garden last year. I don't know about you, but I love animals. We keep lots of pets around here like Angel, as well as Marge, my cat. And I like to plant things in the garden that they enjoy. Take for instance, catnip. You see, it's a member of the mint family and it evokes an enthusiastic reaction from most cats. They go wild for it, rolling around and purring and rubbing against the plant. However, it has no scent for humans. You see, this is a hardy plant that looks similar to mint and it's very, very easy to grow. In summer, catnip will produce clusters of white flowers accented with little purple dots. You see, you can keep your plants full and bushy by pinching back the stems. And the way it reproduces, well, in two different ways. The small white flowers that appear in summer will produce seeds that fall to the ground and sprout. And the plant also spreads by underground runners. Now, as far as the dogs go, these are half Jack Russell and half Rat Terrier. We call them Jack Rats. And Angel loves running through the asparagus beds chasing rabbits, don't you girl? Go get some. And then we've got dill. Dill I love to have around because, well, it's a great host plant for caterpillars of butterflies. But the cats also like it. You'll find that dill likes full sun and rich, well-drained soil. You see, the plant enjoys mild weather and does well in the spring and fall, not when it gets too hot. Well, I hope this information is helpful to all those who emailed about dogs and cats and the plants they like. Good luck finding some plants for your garden. Okay, coming up next, we're going to revisit Susan Harper and we're going to get that delicious goat cheese recipe, so stay tuned. Uh, goat cheese making is a very easy process. If I can do it, anybody can. It's a very scientific thing. You have to have a good recipe. You have to have really good milk. You have to strain it to get all the impurities out of it from where you've done the milking. Sometimes I get hay in it or feed or little particles of dust or dirt and hair. And then all the other parts of the cheese you can order on the internet generally. Um, you'll need rennet, which is the coagulator, and you'll need the bacteria for their specific sort of cheese. Um, since I'm making Chev here, which is a fresh cheese, I just use one certain um, bacteria. It makes this fabulous cheese and adds a little bit of taste to it. 
I do always pasteurize my milk because in Arkansas there's a law that says if your cheese is not aged 90 days, then you have to pasteurize your milk. Um, so I'm always pasteurizing my milk before I make my cheese. It's a very easy process too. Um, and uh, all you really do is pasteurize your cheese, then the chev takes three to four days, generally a day of draining after you've mixed in your bacteria and your rennet. You leave it to sit for 24 hours. And then the next process is molding the cheese. You scoop it out with a slotted spoon and fill, it, fill the little molds up. Uh, the next day it drains. The next day after that, you take the cheese out and you flip it in the mold so it is very uh, uniform on both sides. Then the next day, it comes out of the molds and gets salted. And the salt, the salting process, um, it, it actually inhibits the growth of bacteria on the outside of the cheese. It also adds to the taste. And the third thing it does is it helps to dry out the rest of the moisture out of the cheese. Um, so it, when it dries, it's this nice uniform shape and the right texture. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you make some of these little treats for the birds, you can also suspend them by wrapping them with some raffia, which is what I'm doing now. Hey, if you want that delicious recipe from Susan Harper, you can find it and all the information in today's show on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing. Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile